Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, Good afternoon. thank you for joining us uh, here with the in uh, during Hanamule uh, Community Day. I hope you've been enjoying the programs they've been um, putting out there, and uh, if not, I hope that you'll sign up for more. As I understand it, there's more out there. <clears throat> um, my name is Bill Schwab. Um, I'm coming to you from Northern Michigan, my studio up here in Northern Michigan. Um, I'm uh, up here the last five years. I have been, uh, prior to that, based in Detroit, Michigan, and some of you may know my work. Um, I've been a commercial photographer for many, many years, uh, no longer, um, thankfully, uh, not to put down anybody's business, but it was a lot of work over the years. I had work in Time, Newsweek, Fortune, Rolling Stone, those kind of things, but in 1994, I gave that all up for the fine art world. And um, since then, I've been represented by various galleries. Um, Tom Halstead of the Halstead Gallery to begin with, and then um, Barry Singer Gallery, Stephen Cohen, that kind of thing. Um, and now I uh, live up here in Northern Michigan. I run the workshop that you see behind me right now, um, Northlight Photographic Workshops. And I like to teach people work and my work's in uh, many museums and private collections, that kind of thing. So. Uh, Anyway, with that all, that all aside, I'm going to introduce other people here, but I wanted to get on with what we're talking about here. Um, in 2017, Hanamiel uh, introduced their Hanamiel rag, uh, platinum rag paper, which a lot of us use now, and um, some, of the, some of you watching um, may already use it, and if you don't, um, you might want to check it out. It's been a very nice paper, a very good paper for all of us to use in that it is a very... Um, strong paper and it works with many processes. I mean, there's no pre-treating needed, that kind of thing. It works with different uh, various alt processes, cyanotype, Van Dyke Brown, salt, gum bichromate, platinum and palladium for which I use it for mostly. And uh, anyway, and several other processes. Um, but today what I'm doing is I'm gonna be acting as a moderator here uh, with three people much more knowledgeable on the subject than me. And uh, they are original um, beta testers for Hanamule uh, when they were developing this paper. Now, um, they were sworn to secrecy at this time. So it came to um, an, a surprise to a lot of us working in the alt process uh, 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 field um, when it came out, but it's been a wonderful thing for us to work with. And anyway, we're gonna talk tonight about different papers and um, I'm gonna introduce these uh, panelists to you right now. And first I'm gonna go with Christina Anderson, who you can see down, uh, well, I'm not sure where she is on your screen right now, I'm sorry to say, but Christina is a professor of photography at Montana State University. Um, she's kind of a guru to a lot of us that work in this process because she knows a lot about different uh, processes. She's written the book on a lot of different things. She is a, um, let's, let me just read here for you. It's Christina Z. Anderson's uh, work focuses on the contemporary Vanitas printed in a variety of alternative processes such as gum and casein bichromate, cyanotype, salted paper, chrysotype, uh, palladium, chemograms, chromo, mordenkage, uh, lumen prints, com and co various combinations of thereof. Um, her work has been shown nationally and internationally in over 120 shows and 60 publications. Um, she's authored several books, which many of you might have in your library already. Uh, uh, has authored books which have sold in over 40 countries. The Experimental Dark Room, her newest book, will be released in fall of 2022, so look for that. Uh, she is the editor for Focal Press, Rutledge's uh, Contemporary Practices and Alternative Process uh, Photography Series, and as I said before, professor of photography at Montana State University. Um, to view her work, you can see more at christinazanderson.com. Uh, which she goes by, but she uh, likes to be called Chris. And so I'll be calling her Chris throughout tonight. And welcome, Chris. Um, next up, we have Mark Nelson, who is a photographer and master printer, uh, printmaker who works both in the platinum palladium and the photopolymer gravure process. Um, Mark left his position as executive director of mental health agency in Elgin, Illinois, USA, to pursue a career in photography in the year 2000. And since then, um, Mark has written several books um, on the, uh, or written a book on the digital negatives, and he's also created a process that some of you might use called the, uh, the precision digital negative process. Um, in addition to his own photography and printmaking, he's been teaching photographers how to make precision digital negatives, uh, cyanotype, photopolymer gravure since 2004. Um, he very much enjoys uh, inspiring photographers to utilize his many advanced printmaking techniques to take their work to a higher level of uh, mastery. 
Um, his personal work includes landscapes, nudes, botanicals, botanicals, and still lifes. Um, his work is in many private collections, known for extremely rich and subtle tonalities. Uh, his use of both the platinum process and photogravure process gives him a broad palette with which to express the delicate nature of his photography. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have uh, Mr. Clay Harmon. Uh, Clay is a photo-based printmaker living in Asheville, North Carolina. For the last two decades, Clay has been using alternative printing processes for memorializing his photographic images. He has mastered platinum and palladium and a host of other 19th century process, photographic process, print processes, such as gum bichromate, cyanotype, and salt printing. Somewhere along this 15 year journey, he began getting ink under his fingernails and dove headfirst into mastering the polymer photogravure process. Uh, while never one to walk away from taking a pretty landscape picture in the northern latitudes, his favorite subject matter is the quirky world of parking garages, nighttime urban scenes, and freeway overpasses, with the occasional salute, uh, statues, but uh, cathedral interior and offbeat portrait thrown in the mix. Um, yeah, that's Clay. Clay's been a wonderful help to many of us along the way. Uh, let's see, he enjoys sharing his knowledge and his taught alternative process workshops for the uh, Houston Center for Photography, Project Basho in Philadelphia, Asheville Bookworks, and right up here at Northlight Photographic Workshops, uh, and the Penland School of Crafts, um, and as well as Mountain and Taglio in Nashville, which is his, uh, his, new, um, uh, his new workshop down there that I highly recommend people to look up and check out. Clay has exhibited widely in both the solo and group shows at Blue Spiral Gallery and Pink Dog Gallery in Asheville, Photo Fest in Houston, Reiko Gallery in San Francisco, Houston Center for Photography, and the Clear Lake Arts Alliance. His work is in the permanent collection at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and in private collections in the Americas, Europe, and the Far East. Thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. It's quite a, quite a group here and I'm honored to be among you. Um, now that we have an understanding, uh, uh, let's see, let's see, thank you all. I, what, I, what I'd like to do now is um, ask each of you several questions. And what I'm gonna do is ask each of you um, individually rather than try to do it as a group thing and, and get real confused here. So I'm gonna do that. But before I get to that, all of you that are watching, um, if, if you'd like to ask some questions, please look below here and you can see that in the uh, Q&A section. If you're gonna ask any questions, please do it there. I um, mean, you're welcome to chat, of course. Uh, but we won't be answering any questions that aren't in the Q&A section. So please uh, ask them there. Clay is going to be our moderator of that, and we will get to those questions as we can. Uh, but first, I want to get to these questions that I'm going to ask each of you. And first, I'm going to go with Christina here. So Chris, uh, please explain to us, um, what, why did you choose the alt processes that you work with? Um, and, and, you know, um, I know that you work with a lot of different things, but let's just choose one here to say, uh, to what's kind of your most favorite to work with and why did you choose that? Um, thanks, Bill. That was great introductions of everybody. And I think <laughs> doing that lengthy, uh, you know, introduction to us. Um, I came upon alt process in 98 and I was taught by a wonderful teacher named Rudy Dietrich, who came from Austria. He was my professor. And um, I had come from a painting background. So when I learned gum printing in that class, that was it. You know, I knew that that would be my area. It would not be painting. Um, and it would not be straight black and white photography because of course at this time, there really wasn't digital photography per se. Um, it, I mean, we had Photoshop and stuff like that, but um, it was like black and white dark room and all processes and stuff. And so I uh, committed to that back then. And I noticed back in 1998 and thereon that, uh, that these kind of processes were very marginal. They were not necessarily recognized in contemporary photography. Um, and they were, it, there was sort of this feeling, and this is gonna put it really crassly um, without swearing, but um, it was sort of like, um, if you did process, you didn't have content. The two uh, you know, couldn't be um, in the same room together. And of course that's uh, been disproven since then. And there's been a huge um, increase in the practice of alternative process photography, which is parallel digital because people wanna get their hands wet. They wanna get their hands dirty and in these things. So I committed back then to um, alt, specifically gum, and when I went away to graduate school, I also did gum printing for two solid years in graduate school. 
And um, so that, that was my foray was painting background, alt process, finding my niche, even though it wasn't popular, even though it wasn't mainstream, even though I might've been looked down on. And at that time, my goal was to make it mainstream and to make it recognized in the art world as a viable alternative to straight C prints, which at the time uh, were uh, the normal thing. And uh, that's what I've done for 22 years, actually 24. Fantastic. I mean, uh, you know, it's funny to say this and I don't even know if I should go here, but I've known a lot of you from online for years. And I remember this coming up where, where we've been sharing all this information and going through this. And, and it seems like it's such a short amount of time, but when you start putting it into those kind of terms of 20 years, 30 years, it's, it's shocking to me how long it's, we've all been doing this, but okay. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. And I think that next I'm going to go to Clay and Clay, same question. Explain to us what, to, uh, sorry, I keep going down my list here. You know, I've got a lot of questions here, so watch out. Uh, uh, Clay, uh, why did you choose the alt process that you work with? Well, I, um, I, I've always been interested in, in photography and been doing it and, you know, got started like a lot of kids in the 70s doing uh, black and white, silver darkroom uh, pro photography. And the, the alt process thing, I was just thinking about this uh, the other day, I actually, I don't know if you remember those uh, time life uh, how to books that came out. Oh, yeah. There was, there was one that was uh, probably published in 72 where George Tice was making a platinum print. And I remember reading this thing and thinking, wow, that looks really cool. I, yeah, I want to I, I, I want to try that. And then about, uh, I guess, would have been about 20 years later, I thought, I want to do that. So I started just diving in and trying to trying to get all of the, the, the material I could and learning how to make a platinum print. And uh, this was in the late 90s, I guess, uh, early 2000s. And there was still, there was, at that time, there was some pretty good information out there book-wise and everything, but it was nowhere near what we have today. And um, you just, a lot of people just learned by uh, uh, stubbing their toes. And I know I did, you know, spend a spend a lot of time getting things wrong, finding out uh, what works, what doesn't work, and um, talking to people. And this, this is right about the time that the internet took off and there seemed to be a growing number of people um, that would share information on, on the internet. The alt photo list was, was very popular at that time and very busy. It's not, I think with the advent of Facebook nowadays, it's not quite as, as uh, busy as it was, but you know, in the early uh, 2000s, it, that, you know, you would get, I don't know, 25, 30 different posts a day on the alt photo list, various questions. And we'd have, of course, there was political, there were political wars between, you know, various camps of the gum printing. And, you know, the, uh, it, it was, it was a good, clean internet fun, I guess, uh, way back when. But I got interested in platinum, just how, and the reason is because it's just a delicious looking print process where the image is, sits in the, in the fibers of the paper instead of on them unlike silver gelatin or inkjets. And I, uh, and that's really the same reason that I eventually moved on into doing a lot of uh, polymer photogravure is that you, all, all of the images sits well within the paper. There's a depth and a tactility to those processes that you just don't get with, uh, with either silver gelatin or, or nowadays an inkjet print. And um, the other thing is that it gives you a little bit of involvement in the, than the process that I enjoy. Um, and, you know, and, and that's not always, you know, sometimes it's a little more involvement than you want, but I do think that there's some, you can get some, there's a feedback loop that goes on between learning a process and um, mastering it and discovering what the process can do. And that feeds back into the kind of images you choose to make. And so I, I think there, there's kind of a, a virtuous circle there in, in trying to learn something that's not immediately easy to do. And I, I, that's kind of certainly was true. And Mark would chime in here with the polymer photography or your, you, you know, learning, I learned it pretty much, you know, you know, all, all on my own and spent a lot of money on plates figuring out how those things worked. Uh, but, you know, it was, it was, it was rewarding at the end of the day. So that's, that's where I started. And I'm, I want to pass it back to you, Bill, but that's, uh, I chose it because it just is, it just has a, depth in the tactility you just can't get another other media 
Oh, well, yeah, and I couldn't agree more on that. And, uh, you know, I'd also like to say, though, that, you know, back to what Chris was saying about um, kind of being on the outskirts of things and a, an outlier at one point. And, but then you and Chris and all the people on that list that we used to communicate with, you know, that spawned something. And, you know, I learned a lot from all of you, whether you know it or not, you know, Clay, obviously, because we've talked for years about these different things you taught me um, polymer uh, photogravure when you were basically starting into it as well. I, I actually have Clay's old press. But um, but yeah, there is something about it that is quite involving. And I think that what happened is a lot of us came to it at a time when, you know, um, there was more of that digital kind of analog um, uh, what, competition going on, so to speak, because we felt like we were losing a lot of our, our materials and things. And this, this was a way to get around that. And you know, what it did is it opened up this incredible world. So anyway, thanks, Clay. And I'm going to now get down to Mark here. And Mark, um, how about you go with the same thing? You know, why did you choose the other process that you work with? I know that you're with Palladium and Photogravure as well. So what is it about that, those processes that drew you? Thank you, Bill. Uh, and um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, I think I first started doing all processes about, like many of you, 20, 22 years ago. And uh, I was introduced to them by Sam Wong, Sandy King, Dick Arntz, um, who are still great practitioners of these arts. And it appealed to me a lot because I felt that many of these old 19th century processes had capabilities that really appealed to me, like platinum palladium, for example, the long tonal range of it, the subtle gradations of tone really captured my imagination. And um, <laughs> one of the reasons I think I like monochromatic processes is I grew up in the Midwest. And if, when you grow up on the mid, in the Midwest on a farm, well, the winter is black and white. Then you have spring and summer, it's green. Then you have fall, and it's delicious shades of browns. And, and the palladium just kind of mimicked that. And I was really into the fall textures and colors that really grabbed my attention. Um, the other thing I like, and, or another thing that I like, is the ability to use a variety of papers. I'm really kind of a paper freak. And um, uh, there's so many beautiful papers that look great, that feel great in your hands. And to be able to work with uh, images that are non-reflective, if, if you understand what I mean, uh, like silver gelatin, if you do a, a, uh, that on a shiny surface paper, there's too many reflections competing with the image. Uh, but uh, working with uh, matte printmaking papers, you don't have that issue to deal with. Um, and many processes also have a characteristic, uh, especially gravure, where the image is in the paper. It's three-dimensional. And I think even palladium has sort of a, an appeal like that. Um, so... And I like to tinker. I think one thing about people who do all processes, they like to go to the hardware store. They like to go to the kitchen store and find stuff to repurpose and uh, be able to do uh, their work with. And even make, I like to make some of my own equipment. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And I can combine my woodworking and metalworking with my photography. Anyway. Oh, thanks very much, Mark. And um, yeah, I agree. We, we all do like to tinker with things. I think, you know, I know all of us, you know, it becomes, it grows out of having to build a lot of what it is that we're working with. I mean, now that a lot more of us are doing it, there's people that are creating, you know, um, print boxes, print frames, all those different things. But there was a time with this where we were sourcing things that were um, either older um, antiques or we were sourcing things from people that decided to build some in their shops. Um, I remember Edwards and, you know, Bostic and Sullivan, all of these people were very supportive along the way in, in keeping us going and, mm -hmm. and that kind of a thing. And to what you were saying about the idea of 
tactility and relief in papers. I feel that same way with gum bichromate and gum over platinum and things, because the more layers that you build up, there's actually this three-dimensional kind of relief to everything. And it's just something about that that you don't get in a, in a normal silver gelatin or in an inkjet, not to, you know, speak badly of either one of those, but the very fact that, you know, you're laying things in the paper and on top of the paper and layers just gives it that more of a more tactile feel to it. I'm sorry, I see you raising your hand there. Yeah, uh, I just want to say quickly one more thing. Um, from the time that most of us started, the internet has grown <laughs> from yeah. hardly anything to an amazing thing like what we're doing right now. And a lot of this would not have been possible without the internet and sharing ideas, seeing work done by other people, learning about processes through other people. Uh, so that has really facilitated a lot of this. Yeah, it's been something different than a lot of, um, you know, than probably any other time. I know that there were a lot of people, you know, throughout the history of photography that were, you know, part of groups and things that shared their knowledge, but this is just such a worldwide thing. And um, <clears throat> I know that I know so much more for that. There's all of the books that I've been through, of which Chris's are a lot uh, that have helped out, but the very fact that we're all actually doing these processes, sharing our mistakes, finding common mistakes throughout all of us. And it's really, I think it's really been like no other time and really, uh, you know, exploded the thing. You know, there's so many more of us now, obviously, if uh, a company such as Hanamiel is creating this paper for us where, you know, it's a wonderful paper that works along a lot of different levels of, of the processes that we use. Okay, well, anyway, I really appreciate that, but now I'm going to throw another bit of a question here at, at all of you, and I'm going to start back with Chris on this one. Um, you know, you're all, I consider all of you master printers. I mean, and, uh, you know, I've learned a lot from you, and a lot of people have, and I think that it's pretty, pretty well accepted that you all very much know what you're doing. But the thing, too, is, you know, you have to, what I'd like people to know is, is, you know, how much this actually takes, you know what I mean? We've talked a little bit about it. We've talked about how many things we've had to build and how much money we've had to spend through plates and that kind of thing. But, you know, explain to us, Chris, uh, what degree of commitment you believe is necessary to master one of these all processes? Well, it's, you know, interesting. In my case, you know, I'm kind of unusual in that I teach these processes. In the fall, I teach experimental black and white photography which would be lumen prints, Morden, Saj, Kemi Grams, Chromo, uh, those kind of things. So it's how to mess up a good black and white print as best you can. And then in the, um, in the spring, I teach all process and I always teach gum, I teach palladium and I teach cyanotype. So by virtue of teaching, I'm forced to do many processes. And not only am I, am I forced, but um, I, I have to be expert at them to teach them or else you know, I'm doing my students a disservice. So that's one of the reasons why I have a breadth of experience, experiences in many all processes aside from the ones that I really prefer. Um, but when I went to graduate school, um, I, gum was, I did not understand it very well. And um, I made pretty crummy gum prints. I still have copies of those from my first semester grad school. And I just thought, you know what, I'm gonna to commit to it and I'm going to do it. And I probably made a thousand prints. And so I say to my students all the time, if you wanna get good at something, do a thousand prints. And they're like, ah, ha, ha, ha. But the thing is, is that is the truth. If you've made a thousand palladium prints, oh my gosh, you'd probably be broke. But nevertheless, <laughs> um, if you made a thousand gum prints, you'd understand the process. You don't get to be a good gum printer by um, taking six weeks in school, you have to commit to it to make it your process of choice, keep doing it and doing it and doing it, and then you understand it. And so the commitment I think um, in alt process is, is lengthy and it is, um, um, it, it's wide, it's broad and long. And um, I would suggest that people um, commit to one, get to know it, then go to another one, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, don't, I don't think you can be a dilettante in, um, in alt process. I don't think you can dabble here and there and expect to get expert prints like some of the people you know. Um, you know, I do a lot of palladium. I do not consider myself an expert palladium printer um, like you guys are. Actually, clay is, 
becoming an expert salted paper printer. I mean, some of his prints I've seen him do are like better than I've ever done. So that was really exciting to see. Uh, um, so, uh, but it's commitment and it, it's time and money and attention. And if you're, if you're not willing to do that, you're probably not going to progress. Well, yeah. And then there's that element of passion. You have to say, I mean, I know that you're fortunate enough to be a teacher and that you can run through these processes all the time, but I have this feeling that if you were not a teacher, you would still be doing this, Chris. So there's that as well. There's that just some sort of an innate passion that we seem to have to keep chasing this carrot and uh, you do it well. So thanks. That's a great, great answer to that question. And I'm going to go a little out of order here and I'm going to throw this one to Mark and catch you a little off, uh, a little off guard there, Mark. Uh, you know, I, um, Explain to me, I mean, you've been at this since 2000 full time and you've, you've kind of, you know, written this, you know, you've taken it the tinkering way as well because you've made it possible for a lot of people to make really good prints without having to go through a lot of the uh, headaches that a lot of us have gone through. But anyway, so just to explain to us the degree of commitment that you take, you think it takes to become a master at one of the processes or any of the processes? Well, I'm kind of one of those people that, limits what I'm going to try to do to one or two processes, in this case, two processes, because I feel you have to focus. And Chris has stated this very well. Um, you can bounce around from all through all different kinds of processes, but you'll never really master one. Uh, but if that's your thing, that's fine. That's okay. Uh, I would say also, if you want to cut down your costs and your time. And like Clay was saying about learning uh, photopolymer gravure, I went through a lot of plates and a lot of money before I got a decent print. Uh, take a workshop with somebody that knows what they're doing. You know, I'm not saying that just because I teach it, but um, I tell my students a lot of times, if, if let's say you're doing palladium, okay, take a, a film 31 step tablet, print it 10 times and show me that you can print it identical, you know, and get the same results. Uh, there are so many variables that affect these different processes that really mastering one, it takes a long time and I'm still learning. Uh, I don't think we ever stop learning. Uh, there's stuff that happens, you know, you might have a change in climate like we are experiencing that might screw up your print making workflow and you have to adjust for that and find out what's uh, causing that problem. So right now I'm doing platinum palladium, I'm doing photopolymer gravure and I'm still like this, I spent four months playing with photopolymer gravure uh, after the holidays. And I really changed my workflow a lot. I really upped my game quite a bit. Um, and it was fun. Uh, and I made some new equipment for myself to make it easier too. But um, I probably, with these two processes, I probably will not, you should never say never. I think the only other process right now I would like to try is photocopper enamel which is really a weird choice. Um, There'll be a big rabbit hole for you going down there, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've done copper and ammo work before. Did so. you start off on the, uh, on the other stuff? Um, it's sort of like gun <clears throat> with glass and you fire it in a kiln. Well, and, you know, and I agree with you that you, you know, and you know here where I'm talking about mastering certain uh, processes, that kind of thing, but we're always learning, you know, that's the thing is that, uh, you know, I'm always picking up little tips from people and students and workshops that I teach and all kinds of things because, you know, we have this basic combined knowledge of all of us and we just have to take, take it where we can. And, uh, and you know, um, I think again, like I said before that the passion, or whatever it is, you know, I, I, passion's a good word and it's a nice word to give it obsession, I would say, with these processes that we do, uh, you know, helps to do that. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna shift it over here to Clay now. Let's give you that same question, Clay. Uh, you know, I know I've learned a lot from you over the years and you are quite a practitioner and you practice what you preach kind of a thing. Yeah, I, I think, you know, 
part of it depends on your, you know, what you're trying to get out of the process. Uh, it, in my case, you know, I, I it partly, and no one who knows me will be surprised. You know, I, I really I like making, you know, what I would consider very fine prints. So, you know, mastering the mastering the process is a really important part of it for me. Uh, it, the, the you can you've got to be guard against making that uh, mastering the process uh, the only thing you're concentrating on because at the end of the day you you know uh, you have to have a good image behind it to 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 make it worthwhile. Um, but again, there's a you have to you know have that virtue of circle thing that if you'll find that if you master something, you'll see what it, what a particular process can render. It'll stimulate your create the creative side of your brain to 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 come up with something new to do with the process, you know. And I you know I was telling um, this group I just ran across this thing the other day. Uh, I mean, in the last couple of weeks with Photogravure, where a um, uh, strangely enough, somebody who was taking a class from me on learning direct to plate had had developed this way of um, printing on really really thin Asian tissue. And backing it with with silver, and you know, making it translucent, similar to what Dan Burkle has been doing with gold leaf. Right. And uh, you know, it, it was one of those things. It's I I would not even get close to saying I've mastered this uh, by any means, but it was one of those things that you know I got the basics down. And I'm thinking, wow, this is this is really a neat thing you could add to your toolkit. Um, and this. And yeah, you know, I think you'll find that when you anytime Mark was saying like he went back and kind of reevaluated his whole process, you do that from time to time, and um, you find that the, it you get it offers you new avenues for your creativity to express itself. And I think that's really that's really the fun part of this is that you you learn what your prints can do, and then once you learn what they can do, you it feeds back into your creative uh, vision that like okay, now that I know this can look this way. Here's here this here's a subject matter that I want to pursue because I think it would look really good uh, when it was done this way. And so I think um, mastering it is really important in the sense that it needs to feed into your creative part. And having said that, you know this is not the way I operate, but I've known many people who are very good artists who part of what they enjoy about all processes it's unpredictability and they just kind of go with their mistakes they just kind of they just kind of ride you know ride the bronco every day and some you know and there's a lot of failure involved uh, with that approach but there's also some serendipitous uh, winners that you that you end up with so there's not there's not really I don't think there's really one recipe you know one recipe that's that is going to satisfy everybody so if part of it depends on your personality uh, kind of the way you the way you approach things, but I do think that it's really. I, I mean, the only thing I can say with very important is you you need to have a printmaking part of your brain and you need to have an art side of your brain, and they they need to exist uh, in a in a codependent way. But you can't let one become predominant. That's that's I think that's really important. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I mean, agree with that too. It's a uh... You know, and I've heard you call it this and a lot of people, it's, you know, the happy accidents that happen too. you know, there's so many times that we're working and, and we get kind of out of our normal routine and, and, and something happens that's not even near what we're trying to do, but yet it's, you know, light bulb goes off in your head and bam, you're down a whole new rabbit hole. And, you know, and it does, it really does open up your creativity, but, you know, and I've caught, you know, if I could interject a little bit here is like, I've always thought you know, with me is I have to kind of master the process that I'm working on before I can even get to some sort of creative side of it. You know, it's, it's just one of my problems. Like I have to have the tables clean before I can start my project, that kind of thing. You know, it's, um, so it's just the consistency of the work that I get down. And so once I get that down and once I have all that consistency of my workflow down, and I think you probably are all the same way and you know where you've made your mistakes along the way that, that once you've got that, then you can start to spread your wings and really get off into some really nice creative things. And uh, like you say, the serendipitous things or the happy happy accidents are always really nice to, to have and be able to exploit, that kind of thing. Um, well, hey, let's get on to the next thing here. Now that we kind of covered a lot of this, this aspect of it, let's just get into the process of the work here. And one of the things is, is that over the years, we've all experienced a wide variety of different issues with products um, resulting in unsatisfactory prints. And, uh, you know, from your own experiences, uh, uh, teaching experiences more, 
Um, you know, how important do you think is the consistency of your paper choice? Uh, why might people first assume that when problems occur, that it's the paper? I think we've all been through that before when we've kind of messed something up and we're learning it, but we think, well, it can't be us, it's gotta be the paper. Um, does humidity play, play, play a key part in your workflow? And, and Mark, I might've cut you off a little bit earlier because you were starting to get into that, but I kind of wanted to save it for this part of it because I knew I was gonna get to this question. Um, because, um, you know, I mean, all of us live in different environments, that kind of thing. So yeah, so let me, let me throw that at you first, Chris. Um, you know, how important is consistency in your paper choice? Uh, why might people first assume that when problems occur, that it's the paper and uh, does humidity play a, a, an important role in your processes? Okay, one thing I wanted to say in reference to what Clay said uh, too, before I answer those questions, sure. is um, I have a rule in my classes that I teach that um, the students shouldn't throw their prints away for one year after creating them. Because you know how you make a print and you think it's really sucky and you wanna throw it away and you know, you're terrible as an artist, wait a year, and see if you like it. Um, and if you still don't like it at that point, throw it away, but you need perspective because I think we all bring these really heavy expectations of perfection to what we're doing in alt. And um, if, it's not, if it's not matching up to our vision of what it should be, then we're unhappy. And um, a case in point was I gave away a whole bunch of prints that I thought were sucky and, um, then I saw one of them hanging on a friend of mine's wall uh, framed. And I was like, wow, that's a damn good print. You know, I should have kept that. <laughs> and um, the other thing I did once was I threw my prints away in the garbage can and my husband saved one. And then a year later, I looked at it and I was like, oh my gosh, I love that print. And I'm glad he saved it. Now, the converse of that is I throw away a lot of prints that, you know, over time. And if I do not want them to take them out of the trash can, I rip them and shove them way down in there so that they won't be resurrected. So that is, <laughs> you know, you, you have to, you know, at a certain point, yeah. kill, your, kill your darlings. But anyway, um, as far as paper goes, um, consistency is absolutely crucial because you nail your process down and then the paper changes. And um, if it does, um, and that can be a real issue. I have, since I've been working with Conamule and teaching with Conamule for, what is it now, Carol, uh, five years? Um, I have not noticed any consistency issues with the paper. What I do notice is that when seasons change, which usually winter, because I live in a really dry climate, um, is that all of a sudden the paper absorbs differently. And it's, I am one that will blame myself first. I do not think it's the paper at fault. I think, oh my gosh, what did I do to screw up? That is just my personality. Some people have a really hard time um, saying that they might not be the one at fault. And I've seen this in uh, students. You know, I know it's a, it's a personality trait. So um, I think that the first thing you really need to do when an issue occurs is say, okay, what changed? What did I do wrong? Don't blame the paper. Most of the time it's humidity, a humidity change. And I will tell you, I don't come, I don't come up with anything original most of the time. I learn these things from other people. Like I think Mark told uh, Sam Wong about how important humidity was with cyanotype or whatnot. And so I started working with humidity with cyanotype while I was writing the cyanotype book. And all of a sudden it was like, oh my gosh, you know, the solution's not washing off in the water and I've got my highlights, they're not all blown out, everything's working just great. And all it was was humidity. And so um, luckily I had not finished writing the book at that point. And so I added humidity into the chapters, um, but that was something that changes with seasons and will change your practice. You'll have to mold your practice to humidity and um, people will um, assume that, you know, that it's the paper when in fact it's humidity. Um, I think I answered your three questions. Yeah, you did a really good job. I'm glad I didn't have to uh, do anything there. So good on you. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's the thing is that you wouldn't think it would be that critical, but it really does change your process. And that goes back to what I was saying about the whole consistency of the whole, whole workflow is that, you know, you find out little things that change and, you know, um, 
humidity never was something in my mind until I moved up where I live now and it changes so drastically in the seasons and you just have to change your practice when it, when it happens, keep a hydrometer going and keep, keep tabs on that all. Well, that was great, great answer. I'm gonna throw the same way, uh, same question over to Mark. Um, basically three-part question. Uh, let me reiterate that for you. And before I do that, let me go back to the, uh, and, and just explain, you know, have at it with questions, um, but make sure if you're gonna do that, do that in the Q and A area. I can see that there's a little bit of chat going on, which is really cool. Um, I wish I could jump into it because I like to chat, but anyway, go back over to Q&A if you have any questions like that, and we'll get to that if we can at the end here, all right? So anyway, back to Mark. Uh, Mark, how important is the consistency of your paper choice? Why might people first assume that when problems occur that it's the paper, and does humidity, humidity play a key part in your workflow? Oh, I'm not hearing you. Um, excuse me, is that something to do with us or you? There, is that better? That's better, yeah. there you go, Mark. Yeah, you're good. I had shut my microphone off so you couldn't hear me going, oh yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, um, um, the things I look at in a paper are the look and feel of the paper, the ease of use of the paper, uh, how well does it render different types of images and that kind of thing. And I learned a long time ago when I was developing my um, digital negative system that humidity was an incredibly important um, uh, variable to, to keep track of. And I had some discussions with Dick Arnes about this and I was using platinum palladium as my uh, test uh, uh, process. So uh, I think it was around that time also <laughs> that people were complaining because of some papers, the manufacturers thought, oh, you know, we don't really want acidic papers. We want papers that'll last a long time. So they started buffering the papers. Well, buffering papers kills about most of the processes I'm familiar with, you know, like cyanotype or palladium or whatever. And so you have to pre-soak the papers in uh, acid uh, to get rid of that. And that's just way too much work for me. I'm not going to do that. So I really suggest check with what people are using for a particular process. Find a paper that is easy to work with. Use it at least start with it and do your and develop your uh, skills with that process with a paper like that. Um, it's to me, I'm not going to be soaking no papers in acid uh, to make a print. I'm just going to go grab a piece of paper and, and work it. When we were testing the, the uh, annual platinum rag, it was real apparent to me that this paper gave you rich blacks and gave you a good tonal response. And that is a, in the earlier iterations of the paper. I mean, it was good when we started testing it and it just got better and better. Uh, now, one thing I will say about Hanamio Platinum Rag, and this is where people start blaming the paper and it's not the paper's fault. Every paper has different characteristics. And you have to learn the characteristics of that paper. So don't go saying, I can't make a print on this. It's the paper's fault. It's your workflow, probably, that you need to look at. Um, Panamia Platinum Rag is slightly hygroscopic. It absorbs moisture faster. So if you're used to pre-humidifying your paper, then you don't need to pre-humidify it as much as other papers which is actually in a way a good thing. You can be at it quicker. Um, it also doesn't let go of moisture as easily. So it'll take a little longer, you know, um, maybe for dry down and that type of thing. Uh, to me, going back to the humidity issue, there are two things about humidity, if I can just say this real quick. One, how, what is the ambient humidity and are you pre-humidifying your paper to make it easy to coat? 
that's one aspect of humidity. And some papers need more pre-humidification pre than others. Secondly, what's the humidity when you, or the moisture content of the paper when you're exposing it? Now that gets into what is the scale you're gonna get? Uh, are you, if your paper's too dry, it's gonna reverse on you. Uh, so you really have to be conscious of what are the factors that are gonna be affecting the final, the ease of use and the final print. Great, um, yeah, I, you know, and, and I found, I mean, the, all these characteristics that you're talking about um, are, uh, there are some of the things that I really like about this paper, um, not to talk the paper up too much, but you know, the fact that I don't have to do a lot of the things and, and, and just to kind of clear something up is what Mark was talking about. He's not going to soak any papers in acid, that kind of a thing. And that's the, the, the practice that we have to do to pre-treat some papers that aren't really necessarily made for this process. Just like Mark said, there's a lot of buffers put into a lot of the papers that are out there. Um, for us to use and they do this because they want to make them you know quote unquote ar archival uh, but it, it doesn't make it very um, hospitable to the different processes that we're working with so you have to go through this extra process of acidifying them and it is kind of a problem and that's one of the things that's the beauty of the platinum rag is that you don't have to do that you can just go to the drawer and grab out a sheet and you're ready to go or, or put it in your humidifier whatever it may be um, let's go back now let's go over to clay how about you, Clay? I, what, I know you're working with different things and you're in an environment down there too that's quite humid. Yeah, yeah, we get it. Well, we're very humid in the summer, uh, starting right about now. It's, it you know, can be really, uh, uh, you're dealing with excess humidity in some cases if you're, if you're printing without uh, uh, air conditioning, or, for instance. Uh, and uh, Chris has had this experience teaching at Penland um, you know, which is a, a craft school just north of here. If you, the old the old photo lab didn't really have any uh, AC, and even the new one, they they have some dehumidifiers now. But it it, it could become a real challenge doing anything up there when you're uh, if you get a bunch of rain. You know, it it wasn't wouldn't be all together that hot, but it'd be just really humid, eighty five percent kind of humidity levels throughout the day. And it just you just all sorts of mischief starts uh, coming into play, and you have to you have to knock the humidity down. Um, but, you know, in general, uh, you know, my experience with humidity, uh, you know, palladium, uh, platinum, uh, the process just likes it. The, the, the more humidity you have up to a point, the richer your print's gonna be. And that's why, you know, like I, I adjust my chemistry uh, practice uh, even to, to kind of accentuate that a few years back. I don't. I don't use sodium palladium solution, for instance, anymore. I use ammonium palladium uh, because it's a high, more hygroscopic. I get, a, I get a richer black, you know, all other things being equal than I would with, with the sodium palladium. And there's some few, a few, you know, little tricks like that. Um, but going back to the first part of your question, the consistency thing, it kind of, the, the humidity and the consistency kind of go hand in hand because if you if you understand your paper and it's, it, it behaves consistently, you can adjust your what you're doing on the fly to account for changes in humidity. Like in the winter here, uh, we're, you know, we, I'm up at 3,500 feet in the winter. It's like we have Colorado level humidity. So, you know, it's down 10, 10% or so. So it's, I have to, the opposite problem, I have to humidify my paper. Uh, yeah. So it just swings and swings rapidly. And you have the same problem in Michigan, I'm sure. Yeah. You're really seasonally dependent. Um, so uh, yeah, it's. Illinois um, too. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah. it does play havoc with things. So yeah, it's you know um, regardless of the paper, that's one of the things that we all have to be uh, aware of as this goes. Um, and you know, now that we're talking about the paper too, I wanted to to uh, to bring something up that I didn't earlier and I should have is that we're talking about HPR right now, which we all call Anamil Platinum Rag. Uh, there's going to be a raffle for you to win uh, a 25 sheet package of this at the, uh, in which size here, I'm trying to figure out which size, I think it's the, the, uh, the, the 11 by 15, it's a 25 sheet package, which is a really nice way to go as far as trying this paper out. So there will be a raffle at the end of this. So stick around till the end. And we're not too far off from there right now. Um, well, you guys, I'm going to, going to go with one more question for you here at this time, if, you, if, you'll, uh, if you'll stick with me here. And it, some of it, part of these questions 
part of this might have been answered already, uh, but anyway, we're going to go from this for each of the specific uh, the specific processes that you are using. Uh, is the paper a neutral medium or are its characteristics a key part to your artistic intent? So this is uh, another question up the level. I mean, does the, does the paper just become something to show your work or does it actually become part of the intent of your work? And, uh, you know, is there such a thing as one perfect paper or is a variety of paper important to your practice? So I'm gonna go back to Chris with that one. Uh, is paper, paper a neutral medium? Is there such a thing as a perfect paper kind of a thing? Um, if there were perfect paper and there were only one, it, I wouldn't only use one paper um, because uh, I like using a thin paper, thin weight. Um, I like using a typical uh, paper like HPR, Hanamiel Platinum Rag, which is a um, 140 pound, 300 GSM. Um, I always use, you know, that for like gum printing. Um, and, but I like... Uh, I like using a thin paper. I also like using a texture paper. Hannah Mule um, puts out a couple papers. One of them, um, well, there are two. Uh, it's Turner and Cezanne. And I think they're actually printmaking papers. Both of them are buffered. Um, and I can't remember, I'd have to consult my paper chart because I've tested like 136 papers in every process that I do. But, um, those two papers have a really intriguing surface. Turner, uh, William Turner is a little bit velvety. And um, what I found is that uh, I taught chrysotype this last year and I had never done it before. So I was a newbie and I taught it while I had never done it before, which was really an awesome experience, not in the beginning. Um, in the beginning, it was really bad, <laughs> but um, it was great because the students and I learned it together and I found that some of the papers that do not work for cyanotype were really great with chrysotype. And chrysotype also though, um, loves complete dryness. So it is a different beast, a different process than palladium. If you have a, a completely dry paper, it will exhibit pink colors. You know, if you're going for pinks and split tones and things like that. So it has way more options than um, other processes that I've worked with. William Turner paper works beautifully um, to give you these sort of pinky, purple, velvety look, you know, colors um, that uh, with that particular process, but I wouldn't use it for other ones unless I acidified it. I agree with Mark that I don't want to use sulfamic acid to acidify paper. I've done that in the past, but I'm going to find papers that I don't have to do that with. I don't particularly want to have that in my dark room with um, students. Um, even though sulfamic acid, the percentage you're using is low enough that it's not that big of a deal. It's, it's toilet bowl cleaner, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. right? Cleans yeah. your grout, grout, Yeah, grout cleaner. Yeah. Grout yeah. Grout. yeah, so it's a cleaner we use, but nevertheless, with students, you know, there's certain things. I don't use hydrochloric acid in the dark room um, right. because of the uh, outgassing of it. Um, and I just know something's going to happen. So... Um, I would I would stick with Mark on that philosophy of just with the papers that you find work well. Sometimes they're surprising with different processes. Yeah, well, and it's you know uh, that and what you're saying not to not to simplify this, but you know what I find in teaching is that this paper works really great in that way. Is that I don't have to do all of those things, and it's really good not to have to burden everybody with having to work with sulfamic or oxalic or whatever they're doing. Um, you know, so as a teaching aid, it's really great. But not only is that, it's great for my final, my final prints. Um, okay, well, I'm gonna throw that to Mark now, same kind of question. Um, and then we will kind of start to wind this down if that's okay with everyone. Um, I'm looking here in the chat section and seeing things going on here. What I did want to um, tell people is that for more information on the paper that we're talking is go to hanamule.com and, uh, and look up the, uh, the platinum rag in the, uh, in the fine art section. Um, so anyway, let's go with the next, that part of the question later. Let's go down to you, Mark. Um, Could and you repeat the question? The repeat, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand. Okay, yeah. Short so is, 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 the paper, is, is the paper a neutral medium or are its characteristics a key part to your artistic intent? You know, and is there such a thing in your mind as a perfect paper all around? Uh, no. <laughs> Next person? No. Uh, <laughs> I don't. 
I don't think there's such thing as a perfect paper. And hopefully, um, uh, when you find a good paper that really works for you, it has the look and feel you want, and the, uh, it prints the, the tonality of the prints are great, uh, and it's easy to use, it'll stay that way. In the past, you know, papers change and the formulas change, and you get something weird too, like the black spots of death, we call it, you know, that looks like pepper in your print, you know, which may, may be. Uh, filings, you know, from Got a little bit of iron in there. something like that. Yeah. Um, it's to me, it's funny uh, when I have an image and I'm thinking about the image, and sometimes this is right at the beginning when I'm make, taking the photograph, I think about a feeling. I have a feeling of whether I'm going to render in platinum palladium, is it more ton tonal or is it more textural? And I'm using uh, gravure. Uh, also, I may have a feeling about the paper that I want to render it in. And if it's gravure, what color of ink I want to use, that type of thing. So um, it's sort of a spiritual thing i guess you can say <laughs> right right um but uh but i have i am a paper freak i have to say that so i have a lot of different papers to play with um uh, i even made gravure prints on hanamio platinum rag and it actually worked pretty well um <laughs> and, and i found it nice too because uh as i was testing out um detail in my plates I found that that's a nice, one of the nice papers to do that with because uh, it's not real thick. Uh, yeah, it fits you know. down into the, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, very nice. Okay, well, let's see. Clay, are we, we're leaving you hanging out there with that. Let's go with that same question. I mean, I know that you're doing different processes as well. And so um, how do you feel about, you know, is the paper part of your intent or is it just something you grab? Oh, I it very definitely is a part of it. And I, you know, I'm kind of touching on both of the other answers. Um, I think there's probably a perfect paper for what you're trying to do for just about any process. I mean, or any, any vision. I mean, and it, it really kind of depends on what you, what your intent is, but you know, right. there are some, some images and some things you're trying to do where, you know, you want, you want delicacy and, uh, Kind of uh, uh, like a really light thing, and so, you know some of these thinner Asian papers are just the just the ticket for those uh, for those images. And there are others where you want um, you want the, the paper to just perform well mechanically. You mentioned, you know, particularly in photogravure. I mean, it's not a chemical process; it's a mechanical process. So you know, papers that fall apart uh, when you put a, put them under a lot of pressure, which you know some of them do, and they stretch badly and you know, you have to take all those things into account when you're, when you're making your prints. Um, so I don't think it's, it's definitely not a, it's not a neutral thing. I mean, it's, it's the tone of the paper, the, the texture of they all, they all feed into your, what, what your image is going to look like um, at the end of the day. So I think you, you, you know, and the more, the more experience you get, the better you get at judging what they're really going to do. Uh, so that's, um, I'd say there's no, and there's no, you know, there's, I don't think there's one perfect paper. There's a lot of perfect papers for uh, specific things. No, and you can, and you, you just have to just do enough of it and try them out and find out what, what that yeah. paper is. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what I always tell everybody is, you know, I get a lot of questions and, you know, I say, well, I don't know, is it, you know, I mean, give it a try. Somebody should yeah. just try those things. And, uh, you know, I know that a lot of us have gone through the trial and error and, you know, it's easy. You know, go ahead. I was going to say back to that. I, there, yeah. I think I would, you know, could you put a. I think there is one. You know, there are perfect papers to learn on when you're when you're trying to sort out all. You know, you have all these processes are complicated. You need to you need to just go with the consensus of the the community of whatever uh, community you're a part of, a printmaking or all process photo community, and pick one that everybody acknowledges as a solid paper to learn on because you, what you don't want to do is throw a, a paper variable in amongst a lot of other things that you don't understand yet. 
So, I mean, learning, yeah, I think there's, you, you could say there are probably some perfect papers for learning, you know, because yeah. they are, but, but once you get beyond that, uh, you need to explore. And that's the beauty of this is that even when you get to the exploring part afterward, it's still a wonderful stuff to use. But yeah, I have to, I do have to say interject here is that in workshops lately, I, you know, we'll try to teach different things, you know, with the, the HPR is the, the, the rock bottom, the rock that we go to, you know, I mean, the base of it all, which is great. And then we'll teach some other papers and how we have to treat them and things. And so then people are able to take off on their own and use different papers and invariably the HPR pile disappears because people know it's easy. They can go back and grab and it looks great. Their prints look great. So yeah, it, it really does work out well. And with that, I'm going to get to the raffle point. Thanks. Thank you all. Um, don't go anywhere, but uh, I want to get to the raffle part of this so that uh, any of you watching, oh, I'm sorry, Carol. Um, yeah, I have a quick question. We talked about the importance of humidity. I'd like to know what the panelists think are ways that the people can moderate their humidity, control it, get a handle on it. I'll, I'll give you a real low tech um, method, which I use because I um, live in Montana, which except for now, believe it or not, it's like over 50% humidity outside. We've had a lot of rain this spring, but generally speaking, Montana is probably somewhere between 15 to 30% humidity. So it's really dry. So, um, and Mark was absolutely right. If you over humidify Hanamil Platinum Rag or other papers for that matter, and you're printing cyanotype or palladium, you will get a dull print, a low D max print. The, pr the print will not get its darkest blue or its darkest brown um, because it's got too much humidity. And there's that sweet spot, Clay was saying that too, that sweet spot between somewhere between 50 and let's say 50 and 70%. So what I do is I take a tray and I fill it with water and I put a screen on top of it and I invert another tray on top of that. So I've got a little tray sandwich that has water that just lives in my dark room all the time. I have also started doing this in um, the school lab in the last probably three, four years, um, have these you know humidity areas because the school lab is so big, I can't use a um, humidifier in it. It won't humidify the space enough. And there's variables and stuff. You can't control it, but you can control a humidity chamber, makeshift humidity chamber. And if you want to keep it at about 75%, just dump a box of salt in there and at the bottom. And just, you know, when the water gets evaporated, pour some more water in there. As long as there's salt crystals on the bottom, you're good to go. And it works beautifully. And I always have 16 guinea pig students every semester who test it out. So, you know, if there's mistakes that are occurring, I can spot it right away, but it has been awesome. Chris, you're always great at those things too. Um, you know, I've had questions before with, uh, you know, particularly the Sumi when I was doing the, the, uh, the, the uh, cyanotypes with that. And then that came into hand when I was trying to coat some, um, some Gompi paper at one point. And so, yeah, it's just, uh, there's just a lot there that's, um, Anyway, I'll, I'll get aside from that. I've seen Mark Nelson raising his hand here, so. Just quickly, um, one of the ways uh, in workshops that I try to teach students to test the paper, if they've coated the paper and they're trying to dry it down for exposure, it's just holding it up against your cheek or your wrist uh, and see how cool does it feel. And you can get a sense then of, how dry it is. Uh, damp paper feels really cool. Uh, if you wiggle the paper, it, it'll have a dull sound, but as it dries, it makes more noise. But one way to really tell is with palladium, for example, is you make an exposure uh, and look at the print right after you take it out of the exposure device. And if you're getting like a battleship gray image printing out, that's probably pretty close. If you're getting a really dark image, now this is my practice only, and I'm not saying this will work for everybody. If you're getting a really dark image, you probably expose that with too much moisture. If you get no ghost image at all, then you're probably way too dry. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a good good way to go by it is that latent image that shows up after you pull it out. But specifically with palladium, it doesn't necessarily happen that way with the other ones. But um, yeah, I mean, all, all of you speaking about humidity is there was a point in my time when I thought, well, hey, just make it more humid. Just kick it up, kick it up, kick it up more. And it does, it doesn't work. There's a, that turn, turnaround point and probably, you know, Carol, you said 70%. I'd say 75, 80% when you start. You know, it's kind of ridiculous. You know, you can well, and, and you know, water out of your paper. For photogravure, of course, you know, being, being mechanical, well, you know, that yeah. you get too, you got to, the paper needs to be damp to transfer the ink properly True. to the paper, but too much humidity and you start getting, you know, splotches and blotchiness with it. And, um, you know, the and when teaching classes, you know, the, the students almost invariably refer to it, oh, you know, that print stinks because the paper's too juicy. And, you know, you, you have to, you have it, the things Mark talked about, learning to kind of develop a feel when you pick up a piece of paper, by the way it sounds when you shake it a little bit. Um, <laughs> You know, you you definitely don't want to hear it crackle. You know, with photogravure, no. but you also you also don't <laughs> want this thing that's static like, electricity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you also don't want it to be you know like a you know a, a well cooked spaghetti piece of spaghetti either because yeah, it's no. gonna you're gonna have this uh, moisture excess moisture causing havoc as those rollers squeeze that squeeze all that water into your that's ink true, and yeah. it just it just makes a mess. So it's there's a it's a it's a Goldilocks thing uh, with a lot of these processes, the combination of the paper, you know, particularly mechanical processes, yeah. paper humidity and the and the pressure of your of your printing press. You know, they all they all have a big factor. Which, you know, kind of brings me back to that consistency of workflow thing. I know it's the little uh, goblin I keep talking about, but it's it really is. It really does help to continue doing everything all the same every time. And, you know, once you find your place. Don't change it too much. Um, but yeah, so anyway, um, does everybody feel pretty good about this? I mean, uh, anything that you'd like to add? Um, I'd really like will, to, agree. I'm sorry. I'll say, I'll say one thing. So um, I'm, I'm sort of obsessed with chrysotype and it was kind of funny because when I took it on, I was not, I had said to myself, don't do any more new processes because I just don't have enough days of my life left to take on another process. Like I won't learn wet plate collodion, even though I think it's beautiful because I just can't, but I did chrysotype. And one of the most amazing things about chrysotype is if you expose bone dry paper, you come out with this printed out image that was, sort of looks scratchy brown. There's like hardly anything there scratchy brown. You stick it in the humidity chamber for 10, 20 minutes, the image just goes boom and appears. Wow. Oh, and then you develop cool. it. It is the coolest thing, and it is such a um, such a visual to understanding how humidity affects a process. Um, it's like an instant crowd pleaser, I guess I would say. Yeah. Wow. Just one more thing to hook me, you know, like seeing that first silver print come up in the uh, deck call on my mom's uh, washing machine when I was 12 years old, you know. Like I've been hooked on this stuff ever since. Now you're going to get me going on this. And never say never, Chris, is what, you know, remember Mark said that, you know. I, I don't know if I could see you doing wet plate, but, you know, believe me, the things that you've done, wet plate would be very simple for you, that's for sure. So She likes chrysotype because her name is Chris. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm going to change my spelling to C-H-R-Y-S. Like, like yeah, Seidem. there you go. Mm -hmm. See, that's a good one. Then nobody would have that name. The other that. one I won't learn is carbon transfer, and I have a student who's really interested in it. And I was like, um, I'll do an independent study with you, but you have to teach yourself and learn it. Yeah. And he's going to go to photo formulary and learn it from Don uh, Nelson this summer. Oh, great. So Don he's going to come or... back and teach me how to do carbon transfer. So if he's uh, got a good thick skin, he can go to Sandy King. And um, yes. yeah, sorry, Sandy, if you're listening, but yeah. I haven't seen how about jello type is anybody doing jello type <laughs> no no i did try some things on leaves that was pretty fun but uh no paper needed. i swear mark before i die i am going to make you a jello print <laughs> i had i had an offer to someone if they would make a full color jello type that i would give them a, an epson printer wow but, but i i'm that offer is no more valid. yeah you better be no careful there's a lot of people watching this right now <laughs> Seriously, uh, I'm yeah. I'm taking you on. No, no, Where it's no longer an offer. Yeah. No, this no. was a long time ago. Uh, Just to well, bug you on the alt photo list. 
I think the gauntlet's been thrown down. You know, it's just add there. a little, just add a little uh, <laughs> dichromate to the, your Jello and get three different colors. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. don't eat that. Okay, yeah. so oh. <laughs> <that's> the, <laughs> well, that that brings me down to the raffle here. Uh, let's let's tell you how to get uh, how to at least uh, try to get this uh, this pack of paper. Um, you know, if you uh, go to enter the raffle, please uh, send your email to USA Artists. Now that would be two A's in there, USA and Artists, all one word at Hanamule.com. Uh, you must include your mailing address and phone number and mention that you've attended today's conference. Uh, you really won't know about this if you didn't, so that's great. Uh, winners will be selected and notified at the end of the week. Um, and that's about it. You know, uh, I really thank all of you a lot for being part of this and making it somewhat easy and, uh, well, actually really easy. And thanks to Hanamil for putting this on. Um, you know, it's been an honor to be part of this whole thing. And I, uh, I'm very pleased to be a uh, part of it. And uh, anyway, so yeah, you've all been a real big help and I've learned a lot tonight as well. So uh, I hope everybody else has. Um, are, are there any any things in the Q and A, Clay, that we should be addressing before we sign off? Uh, there were there were a few that I, I answered, but you know, I'm interested to hear your your take. What, one of the ones that I, you know, I thought, you know, since they're almost all of the processes uh, use either a digital negative or digital positives. Where there was a question about, is there any uh, thoughts on preferring Epson versus? Uh, uh, the other, uh, other ones, yeah. Hewlett, well, uh, Hewlett, I guess Hewlett Packard and uh, yeah, Hewlett Packard uh, and Canons. Canon, I mean, primarily Canon, I think. You know, the uh, Hewlett Packard tends to make, uh, although they I th they have printers are certainly capable. And yeah, they're you know, definitely, you know, I think that at least in my experience, the Epsons tend to be the best as far as their ink set, as far as having their yeah. UV blocking qualities. Um, I know that people have had su some successes with Canons and things, but you really kind of have to kick up your ink density. Um, uh, but I, I, I think that there's, there's ways coming that, or, or available ways where you can build curves that could be, could be used with those other printers. But I would say that if you're starting out right now, not to, you know, I mean, I get nothing from Epson, uh, but if you're going to be starting out right now and you want to get into digital negatives, I would not try to reinvent the wheel and probably go with one of the Epson, uh, printers right now. And that yeah, would and I would just add minor. to that, Bill. Yeah. I would just add to that. Um, the, the office type Epson printers don't usually have yeah, uh, make true. good negatives. So you want to stick with, uh, what the photo quality Epson printer? The sure colors, you know, if they, uh, um, sorry for interrupting, but yeah, I, I, I do mean that. That's why I was saying with both the P7, the P900 now, which are the current ones that they're selling. Uh, okay. if you can find previous ones, I, I use a P800 that's sitting right here. Um, they work fantastic. It's the K3 ink set that's quite quite good for this process. Uh, the newer, the P700s and the P900s, they add a couple of inks to the to the mix, and and as I understand it, there the ink density needs to be kicked up on those. So if you're using any of the other programs, I know that Mark's uh, Mark's program. I'm not sure if you've tested that out with any of the new ones, but like with uh, yes, Richard Polo's program that a lot of us use. Um, there is a setting for that, but you do have to kick up the ink density on those newer printers. So be, be aware of that. But yeah, back to the original question. If you're just starting out, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Go with an Epson and, you know, get a hold of them and tell them that we're all doing this so that they have, you know, that so they're, they're aware that this is a, a pretty big market out here. I know a lot of people are doing digital negatives now. Yeah, one of the things I, I, I responded by a text is, or to this question was that it also depends on the, the ink, the, the digital negative uh, process you're gonna use. Like uh, PDN is pretty much printer agnostic. You know, you can use any of the other printers yeah. because it's using the spectral density approach. Uh, whereas something like QT, any QTR based printing, you know, digital negative approach, you're, you're pretty well, I think, well, you, you are, you're stuck with an Epson printer. Right. Uh, so, I mean, if you're, you know, I think that they have a few of the others, I, I was the EDN and EDN and PDN, both are printer agnostic kind of uh, digital negative approaches. And that may influence particular um, stuff. You already have a Canon and you want to try that. You know, you're, you definitely should try PDN because uh, yeah. that's going to be your, that's going to give you your best quickest results uh, with that printer. And 
you know, PDN was probably the first real successful system that I used for that. Yeah. Um, it worked really well. Um, you know, and as far as the Epson printers go too, there's some people out there that use the piezo inks, the cone inks and right. You know, those all can also be used. They have good blocking density and they can also be used with QTR. And when, when Clay is mentioning QTR, everybody should know that that's quad tone rip, um, a pro program that came up uh, from Roy Harrington. But anyway, these are programs that we, we use to build these great curves to print on these papers that we're talking about. Um, and I'm sure that there's some of you out there that are using in-camera negatives at all. And also, and uh, to you, I can just say, be careful drawing your papers and doing things, you know, so you're not uh, destroying them. But um, yeah, I'm sorry, Mark, you, you got your hand up. I was just going to say, a lot of people might not know what PDN is. Yeah. Well, oh yeah. Well, oh yeah. Precision digital. <laughs> I mentioned it in your bio in the beginning, but yeah, uh, Mark has created a program also that's precision digital negatives that helps you. And it, it's based on a color, uh, on, a, on spectral, rather than the, the ink densities, that kind of thing. But so it works, it works on a slightly different process, too. but similar results. Um, it, you know, so there, these are all different, different ways to go about uh, making your digital negatives. And, you know, those of you that are doing that, more power to you. It's, it's kind of the way to go these days. I know there's a lot of purists that like the in-camera negatives, but uh, there's nothing like being able to bend a curve to a process. You know, all these processes that we use have different exposure scales. Um, palladium way out here, platinum down here, you know, um, uh, cyanotype down here. So it's, <laughs> and salt. It's all way out here. Out, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, it's amazing stuff. You know, yes. there's infinite range of tones between uh, black and yeah. white. So, um, but anyway, with that, um, definitely um, send in an email uh, and try to uh, see what, you're what you can do about the paper here. Um, does anybody have anything else before we yes, sign off? I on? wanted to thank you for moderating, Bill. Ah, you yes, did a thank great you. job. Yeah, I wanted to thank, thank you. you all for attending and for being our guest speakers. Bill, you're an excellent moderator. Ah, thank it's you. It's such an honor to have all of you join us today. Thank you so much. And well, thank thanks you, for putting Carol, it on. for your support. Yeah, yeah thank yeah. you. Yes. Call me anytime, Carol. Thank you very much. Yeah, happy to do it. All right. Okay. Leaving time. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you for coming. Okay, thanks.